Hey everyone, this is John Buchkowski, your instructor. I hope you're all having a great day. So for this section, we're going to be talking about Reconstruction and everything that happened after the Civil War. So this is to provide some nice context for everything that's going on uh, after the Civil War. How is the United States going to be reconstructed? How is it going to come back together? You know, the North and the South had just experienced this long, awful war where over 600,000 men were injured or killed. Everyone was impacted by this conflict. And there are going to be multiple sides as to how the United States should come back together. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, there are three questions that I think we need to really think about when we're talking about this topic. First, how did the South enter back into the Union? How were they readmitted into the Union? Was it a simple measure or was this a challenging process that took years um, as everyone figured out uh, what the South's role in the new United States is going to be? How were African Americans impacted by this decision? And finally, what is the difference between reconstruction and restoring, between reconstructing and restoring the Union? Um, so to... Uh, uh, not to, uh, yeah, to give away uh, the, the answer, I mean, first, this is going to be a time period that's known as the dawn without noon. There's such a promising beginning to this time period in which it appears that African Americans are going to be able to achieve full equality and have all of their civil rights restored to them. Yet, the Republicans in the North and a lot of Northerners who were pushing for a harsher uh, reconstruction, a harsher readmission of the South, give up on this plan. So although there's this promising beginning, there's going to never be this actual conclusion uh, to providing civil rights for African Americans, giving them full equal rights under the law, and granting them full citizenship as well. So by 1877, when Reconstruction ends, uh, the North is pretty much going to pull out of the South, um, before uh, the South was uh, occupied by Union troops, but um, by 1877, Reconstruction is going to come to an end, and there's going to be uh, uh, segregation and eventually legal discrimination that will be tolerated in the South as a result of the Jim Crow laws, which will be approved by Plessy v. Ferguson. So, in short... The reconstruction is going to begin really promising, but it's never actually going to come to a happy conclusion. Remember, the United States was a slave republic. Slavery was written into the Constitution with the Three-Fifths Compromise. Slavery was such a large part about the South's identity. Not that many people owned slaves, but it was a slave society in which... Um, Many of, uh, many of the people were fighting for this right to be able to own other people because their economy was based in it, their society was based in it. They believed in having um, this ordered society where white people were at the top and at the bottom were black people. They believed that this is the best way to have a society. And as you can see, 12 presidents owned slaves at some point in their lives. Eight presidents owned slaves while in the White House. For 50 of the first 60 years of the Republic, the president was a slaveholder. Washington and Jefferson both had over 200 slaves. So we can see that slavery wasn't just this fringe aspect of the South, but it was a major part of society and of politics as well. So the South, after the Civil War, had been destroyed both economically, politically, they lost a lot of their manpower to the war. Many of their cities have been destroyed, and a lot of the infrastructure. I mean, it's just something where physically, emotionally, spiritually, any way you want to think about it, the North and the South need to reconstruct uh, reconstruct their worlds together. And so at this time, radical Republicans controlled Congress, or the Republicans controlled Congress, and radical Republicans were the ones who were uh, leading the charge in how the United States was going to come back together. So they decided to bring their leadership into the South and to rewrite the Constitution to um, amend a lot of the differences that they wanted to see take place, primarily in regards to African American rights. So, uh, in 1863, uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, passes uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, and 
1865, uh, Congress passes the 13th Amendment, officially making all people in the United States free. The Emancipation Proclamation was significant because it actually encouraged more African Americans to join in the Union's fight, to flee from the South, join the Union Army, and fight uh, fight in this war as well. So I think over 50,000 African Americans actually participated in uh, the war, fighting um, in segregated units, and fighting for their freedom and for their right to be free people as well. After the war, the 13th Amendment... Um, that was said that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So the United States is now putting in the Constitution as slavery, except in or coerced slavery, except in the case of punishment of a crime is now going to be illegal. And that's going to be significant as well. If When we look later on uh, in history, a lot of people actually use convict labor as a form of new slavery as well. And some people suggest that this is the reason why African-American servitude or African-American incarceration rates are so high, is that it is to uh, still get free labor from black people, essentially. And so even though it's great that the United States uh, officially passed the uh, the 13th Amendment ending slavery, the United States was still only one of the last nations, one of the last uh, Western uh, 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 Western civilized nations, um, or Western civ nations, yeah, to abolish slavery. Only Brazil and Cuba still maintained this institution late into the 19th century. So it's not like the United States was on the, the breaking uh was on the cusp of uh, something great. You know, they weren't starting this new trend. Most of Europe had already abolished slavery by uh, the 19th century. And in fact, the Atlantic slave trade had been made illegal in the early 1800s. I want to say it was 1806 or 1808, something like that. So slavery was already uh, on its way out. It's just that the United States um, was so slow to officially abolishing it as well. Okay. Now, I think that this is interesting to see about how African Americans talk about their personal experiences of newfound freedom. As you can see, um, you can take some time reading this. I'll upload this PowerPoint after we're done, or you can pause the presentation here to read it. But we get a sense that a lot of African Americans were uh, jubilant at um, this uh, newfound freedom. So, see, as you can see, everybody went wild. We felt like heroes, and nobody had made us that way but ourselves. We was free. Just like that, we was free. So, uh, a lot of the black people started trying to find new opportunities. They left their uh, plantations where they had been slaves. Uh, as you can see here, this man, my father, he'd round up cattle, unbrand, unbranded cattle for the whites. They was cattle, and they all belonged to all right. They had they had gone to find water along the San Antonio River and the Guadalupe. Then the whites gave me and my father some cow or our own. My father had his own brand, 7B. Um, and we had a herd to start out with of 70. We know freedom was on us, but we didn't know what was to come with it. We thought we was going to get rich like the white folks. We thought we was going to be richer than the white folks because we was stronger and knowed how to work. And the whites didn't. And they didn't have us to work for them anymore. But it didn't turn out that way. We soon found out that freedom could make folks proud, but it didn't make them rich. So you can see that. And he says, did you ever stop to think that thinking don't do any good when you had to do it or when you had to do it too late? Well, that's how it was with us. If every some other son of a black had thrown away his hoe and took up a gun to fight for his own freedom along with the Yankees. The war had been over before it began, but we didn't do it. We couldn't help stick to our masters. We couldn't no more shoot them than we could fly. My father and me used to talk about it. We decided we was too soft and freedom wasn't going to be much to our good, even if we had education. So you get the general sense that they were working hard, but there's something about society that actually didn't allow them to be rich, that something was holding them back from actually achieving uh, a higher social status. So this is interesting that he's alluding to it. Um, and, yeah, uh, these are uh, yeah, some of the issues that African Americans are going to face, is that even though they're free, they will never, they can't truly be equal at this time. And uh, this is something that uh, people are constantly having to be cognizant of, aware of, how do black people 
black people become more free. Okay. So after Abraham Lincoln had passed away or was assassinated, his vice president was a real intolerant uh, man who's a complicated figure. His name was Andrew Johnson. And Congress, uh, he uh, is an interesting figure because um, he had served as military governor of Tennessee from 1862 to 1864. To find the Confederate stand, he had declared that treason is a crime and must be made odious. So he was all about reuniting the Union. He didn't approve of uh, the Confederacy from secession or from seceding. He wanted to restore the Union. And yet, while he was uh, pro uh, reunification, he was still um, a racist who had owned slaves at some point in his life. He didn't really care about black people that much. He only cared about the Union. And on some level, Abraham Lincoln uh, was of that um, was of that brand as well because he really cared about reunification. He also cared about freeing the slaves as well and freeing black people. But Abraham Lincoln was really concerned with reuniting the nation as well. So. Abraham Lincoln was going to pass this plan known as the 10% plan, in which 10% of the voting body of a southern state, if it approved reunification, rejoining the Union, would be admitted back into the Union. So only 10% of people, a lot, a lot of um, Republicans in the North felt like this was too radical of a stance, or that this was too lenient, too light, that they need to really punish them and make sure that this would never happen again. Anyway, Abraham Lincoln uh, died, uh, was assassinated, and Andrew Johnson took his place. So Congress, now that it has passed the 13th Amendment, feels like it has the um, momentum to be able to pass the Civil Rights Act, in which all people would have their civil rights protected. That means equal protection under the law. It means that police officers couldn't uh, search and seize you without probable cause, that you would have the right to your body, that um, uh, you wouldn't be able to, or that anyone who committed a crime against you would be tried according to the law. Um, you know, and for example, think about lynching and vigilante justice. In most cases, people weren't tried or, persecu or um, prosecuted for lynching someone or for vigilante justice because there wasn't this equal protection under the law. So Congress sought to pass the Civil Rights Act, which would have ensured African American civil rights, would have granted them the right to vote, they would have been viewed the same as white people had this act passed. However, Andrew Johnson vetoed this law in favor of restoring the South to its previous position. So instead of making it more difficult for the South to enter back into the Union by approving a constitution that has both granted African Americans freedom and also given them the same rights as white people, Andrew Johnson is going to veto that and instead promote presidential reconstruction or this conservative approach to reuniting the nation. One of the really awful aspects of presidential reconstruction sorry, uh, yeah, is uh, black codes. We'll go back to that slide in just one second. Black codes were a series of laws passed in the South that limited the rights of African Americans. This is what a lot of Southerners believed was going to happen if African Americans were given um, uh, complete freedom, if there weren't any laws specifically, uh, uh, specifically addressing African Americans. So this is the vision of a South without uh, black codes and that one that's controlled by the Freedmen's Bureau, which was the organization that protected African Americans uh, gave them, protected their right to vote, um, also helped them attain education, helped them uh, set up businesses and get on their feet. So it says that this is an agency to, quote, keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. So you can see here is this um, uh, um, racist cartoon of an African-American person lounging while white people are working, plowing, chopping wood. And so it's all about um, how... We need to have these laws. Southerners believe that they need to have these laws so that black people would be required to work because they felt like they were going to receive too much of an advantage from the Freedmen's Bureau. Okay. Just a quick note on the political parties. You may have been hearing that have been saying Republicans are in the North and Democrats are in the South. Well, this is how things worked at this time. The Democratic Party was founded by Thomas Jefferson, and it believed in the promise of giving every— of um, 
uh, representing um, common people's opinions, of representing farmers and agrarians, of representing immigrants as well. The Republican Party was represented by industrialists, bankers, and also nativism, which is this belief that um, immigrants and foreigners are dangerous to society, that they're going to ruin American, uh, the American way of life and politics. So as you can see here, Lincoln, who was a Republican, won northern states because the north is going to have a lot of industry along uh, the um, Great Lakes and near the coastline so they can ship their produce, and also a lot of bankers. Um, the south is going to be primarily immigrants, or is going to be primarily farmers, um, and a lot of people who are raising cotton and things like that. And a lot of the immigrants are going to be uh, living in the north as well. So they'll be congregating in cities. Yet, remember, cities weren't that big at this time. I mean, they're growing rapidly, but most people are still living primarily in smaller communities or on the land. It's not going to be until, um, I want to say, it's it might even be in the 1860s that there are more people living in cities than in rural, rural areas. By, but by 1900, um, a vast majority of Americans are going to live in cities. So that's also going to contribute to it. We'll see that there's this shift as um, cities become larger pieces of the political puzzle as well. Okay, so get yeah, back to Black Codes. This is one, for example, uh, from the Mississippi Black Codes. Be it further enacted that the said court shall be fully satisfied that the person or persons to whom said minor shall be apprenticed shall be a suitable person to have the charge and care of said minor and fully to protect the interests of said minor. The courts, the said court shall require the said master or mistress to execute bond and security payable to the state of Mississippi, condition that he or she shall bring, uh, shall furnish said minor with sufficient food and clothing. So this is a bunch of legal leads that's essentially pointing back to slavery, that a person, a young person shall be apprenticed. So a young person is going to have to work for a master and a mistress. The master and the mistress is going to be paying the state of Mississippi for the right to apprentice this child or this young person. And what they're going to do is that they're going to furnish this person with food and clothing. So this minor really isn't going to have many rights because it's being apprenticed by uh, the master and mistress. So this is just getting back to the point that this is essentially slavery still, that they're working to bring back slavery. Um, some of the other black codes would make it illegal for African Americans to congregate to hold a religious service in a town to uh, possess or bear arms. If they were found to be idle or to not be working, they could be arrested and forced to work um, as a result of larceny laws or something like that. So they're trying to make sure that African Americans are always working, that they aren't actually expressing their opinions, that they're silent, that they're not seen, that they're working. Um, that they can bear uh, arms. So this gets back to this point about civil rights, the fact that they're not even, even being protected by the Constitution according to this law, these laws that the South was allowed to pass as a result of presidential reconstruction. They were allowed to pass these laws. They were on uh, the brink of being readmitted into the Union. And yet the radical Republicans are going to do what they can to protect African Americans from violent attacks in the South as well. So they realize that Andrew Johnson isn't going to be on their side. And what they're going to do is they're actually going to veto um, Andrew Johnson because of his unwillingness to work with Congress. And also they pull some uh, charges that he's trying to use the military, um, that he's trying to uh, use the military to um, overthrow Congress and establish a dictatorship, essentially. And so Congress is going to uh, veto, uh, successfully, uh, or is going to successfully impeach uh, Andrew Johnson. Johnson's going to go to trial, and he's going to remain as president. He's not actually going to be officially um, removed from office, but he's actually going to be brought to trial, and he's going to be almost... Uh, removed from uh, Congress as well, or removed from the presidency. However, that doesn't work, so Congress is going to turn him into a lame duck president, and the House and the Congress are both going to be held by Republicans, so they're going to try to pass other laws as well. Because, I mean, during this time, 
the Reconstruction was a very violent time in U.S. history. It's not like the Civil War is over and all of a sudden everyone or everyone is happy again, that they're just able to reunite and, um, you know, figure things out civilly. The Ku Klux Klan and these other white supremacist groups, such as the Ku Klux Klan and the White League, are going to actually harass, terrorize, and murder many African-American people. They, they'll incite riots. Um, and by the end of Reconstruction, over 10,000 black people were killed in the South. As you can see here in this illustration, um, the KKK and the White League are going to reunite or are going to hold hands over this issue known as the Lost Cause, that the Civil War was fought, that um, they lost uh, they lost the right to uh, uh, states' rights, and that's what they have to fight, you know, and that um, slaves are and black people are the reason why uh, the South was broken up as well. So they're going to take it out on the black people and try to uh, subjugate them as well. As you can see here, this black family is just trying to uh, live their lives out without being harassed. So schoolhouses were being burned. We see lynching in the background over here. This is a white man's government. They're not going to have much representation. And so the system feels like it's, or is going to be uh, arguably worse than slavery because now they're subjugated, forced to work as tenant farmers, can't actually really own their land. So now they're forced to still pretty much be slaves, but they're also going to be harassed and terrorized by these white supremacist groups. And so the KKK was founded in 1865 and terrorized anyone who was not a white Christian person who espoused their far-right ideals. They fought against the Union League and the Freedmen's Bureau, which, were bo which both were organizations that sought to represent uh, the United, or uh, sought to represent, um, uh, uh, yeah, African Americans, um, help them, help African Americans gain education, uh, uh, vote, protect their all of their rights. So overall, I just want to make sure that I highly emphasize this point that Reconstruction was an incredibly excuse me, was an incredibly violent time. And so, like I said, after um, President Johnson is uh, essentially impeached and made into a lame duck president, the radical Republicans are going to um, have a, uh, have control of um, a lot of the acts and laws that are passed at this time. And so they're going to begin um, a series of amendments that are going to be known as the Reconstruction Amendments. They're technically the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And so the 14th Amendment is, most, is arguably the most important amendment of all. Section 1 reads, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enhance any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And so this is this radical law that, or this radical amendment that's going to be tested several times throughout history. A lot of people are going to question um, how far does this law go? Is this something where women are going to have equal rights under the law as well? Do people have rights to their bodies? Do people um, have rights to um, uh, the reproduction? Um, how does this impact immigrants, people who are coming to the United States? What about immigrant laborers? A lot of things are going to be tested by this amendment um, as it's going to be interpreted and represented in a variety of ways. And yet... There are going to be many people who still view this amendment as um, they're still going to be able to get around it because it's offering equal protection. But that's how Plessy v. Ferguson is going to be passed and, or approved or handed down in 1896, is they're going to believe that there is this equal protection under the law, but there can be separate but equal uh, institutions. And so that's why this equal uh, this word equal is so important here, is separate but equal. The fact that people don't necessarily have to be in the same place, it just have to be in sequel, in uh, equal uh, places as well. Okay. So yeah, here's another thing is the Freedmen's Bureau was an, a federally, sorry, I don't know why I put it, and friendly. 
a federally appointed organization that protected African-American rights, that created schools for blacks and read contracts to ensure that they would not be cheated by their employers. So this protected African-Americans from being at, taken advantage of by other white people. And here we see that the Freedmen's Bureau is represented as a promoter of racial peace. This is something that's going to help the United States come back together to recover. People won't feel like they're being cheated, things like that. The 15th Amendment is uh, interesting because it granted all people, or it stated that no person um, will be denied the vote based on their race. Okay, so this is radical. You know, black people now have the right to vote, right? I mean, before uh, Reconstruction ends, we actually have two African-American senators that are elected into office in Mississippi, as you can see here. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's pretty awesome, right? Well, one of the things that happens is that with the 15th Amendment, it states that they can't be segregated against based off of race. But that doesn't prevent people from being um, uh, from not being able to vote because of um, their ability to read. They could pay a poll tax. There might be an intelligence test. So there are going to be a variety of ways where they still restrict African-Americans votes through a variety of measures such as literacy, paying a poll tax, anything like that. I mean, today it's already hard enough for a lot of us to get out to vote as it is. I mean, if you don't take work off or if you don't find a notary or fill out an absentee ballot, any of those things, it's just more of a hassle. And so imagine it not only being a hassle back in the day, but also having to pay an additional poll tax or having to take a test or do anything else. So the 15th Amendment looks really good on paper, but the South is going to find ways around that law as well. Similar with the 14th, this equal protection, separate but equal, can't be discriminated against by race. We'll find other ways, according you know, how the Southerner uh, politicians would have spoke, talked about it. And so Reconstruction ultimately has all of these major victories in passing the 13th through 15th Amendments. And yet, the North is starting to get tired of trying to help with this reunification. They're tired of uh, trying to fight this, or trying to continue this war, and they're actually more interested in this new age to come, this industrial machine age that's um, increasing the industrial capacity of the North. Um, people are uh, getting new jobs, the gross domestic product is growing exponentially. People are more interested in making money and this new economy that's developing rather than fighting for the rights of African Americans. And so in the election of 1877, Reconstruction ends in earnest with the Hayes-Tilden decision. The Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and the Democrat Samuel Tilden reached a virtual tie. And uh, Samuel Tilden was from New York as well, so this is interesting to see how there are going to be some Northern Democrats that are running, um, especially from cities um, like New York City. They reached a virtual tie. Tilden had the, major the majority in the popular vote, but Hayes won the Electoral College. And I mean, this was something where it was coming down to a few hundred votes that were separating the two candidates. So to settle this issue and to appease their, con their constituencies, Hayes would win the election if federal troops ended their occupation of the South. As a result, Reconstruction ended, but little had been accomplished as the South condoned Jim Crow laws and allowed the legalization of creating a second-class citizenry uh, 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 of African Americans in, uh, in the black community. And so this is going to even reach a point where um, this is going to be approved by the highest court with the Plessy v. Ferguson decision in which separate but equal is man or is okay. I mean, that's, um, it's going to be accepted in the South. And so that's, that's an important, uh, Supreme court decision, uh, for you to know as well. And so one of the things that a lot of people have been talking about recently is the issue with monuments, especially in, uh, South Carolina with, um, the Capitol taking down the Confederate flag, um, that would fly near it. And also um, many other uh, Confederate monuments uh, that um, have been symbolic for a lot of the lost cause or um, um, the lost cause or uh, justifications for uh, racist ideology as well. 
And so there are historians who have been looking at this issue for a while, and one who is really convincingly uh, looked at the this issue, his name is David Blight, and he said that the United States, after uh, the Civil War, had three choices for how we could come back together. They could reconcile, essentially say, we forgive each other, let's not worry about this anymore, let's not try to fix society. They could remember the war and also change the history of this war to focus on the bravery and the heroism between both sides, essentially um, allowing for this uplift of uh, white men and veterans so that they could remember their bravery, remember the Civil War as this good moment. Or they could seek justice and fully punish the South, force them to pay reparations, force them to address this issue with African Americans. The South was not right to forget and built monuments to create a cult around those who died. And the North essentially followed suit and said, yes, let's reconcile, remember this war, and essentially uplift the white men who had fought, died, or uh, and had, had, uh, uh, had died in this uh, conflict as well. And it's not surprising either. I mean, white people were the ones who held a majority of the political office, and um, this is a way that they would be able to justify and help bring back the United States. And so essentially what's going to happen is that black people are going to be forgotten as well. Their role in the Civil War isn't going to be appreciated for what it was. And now we're going to see this issue about was the Civil War actually about slavery or was it about states' rights as well? And that's where the lost cause really comes in, is that it's about the South knowing it was going to lose this war, but it had to fight to uh, preserve its interpretation of the Constitution, that the states didn't have to be uh, subjugated by the federal government. But it completely ignores the role that slavery played in the South's economy as well. And so by remembering the South forced the Union to celebrate the Confederate heroes and as a result reconcile over this issue. So here are some of the Confederate monuments and memorials that demonstrate the bravery and heroism of them, but it doesn't really show the much or the complicated issue of that these men, some of them may not have owned slaves. I mean many of the officers would have. I mean uh, there was a large um, I mean the vast majority didn't own slaves, but there were so many who did. Not everyone owned slaves, but they were fighting for a system that they believed in, and that system was based in slavery. And so these memorials in this issue become so complicated when we're looking at um, the fact that many of these people who fought and died in this war didn't own slaves, but they knew that they would have been fighting to preserve and to maintain the slave society. Okay. So what do we learn today? Essentially, let's just go back to the beginning when we're talking about these questions about how did the South enter back into the Union. It was initially going to be very easy for them until the radical Republicans tried to establish more difficult standards for them to enter into it. They had to approve of a constitution that had the 13th through 15th Amendments. African Americans, it's this promising moment where they feel like they'll have full equality, and yet this isn't actually going to come to fruition for them either. And so I didn't really actually say this. I'm glad I came back to these questions, but what is the difference between reconstruction and restoring? Reconstruction means building something new, about con uh, constructing something uh, brand new, about constructing a South and a North that could potentially be fully equal, whereas restoring is we're going to restore the South to its original um, condition. And that's essentially what Andrew Johnson was trying to do. He was trying to restore the South back to uh, its uh, previous condition, while the North and the radical Republicans are trying to reconstruct this world so that um, African Americans will be equal to uh, whites down the South. And many of the radical Republicans even suggested breaking up the um, old plantations and dividing the land up between black people as well. So that was a possibility. That was something that they were fighting for, but it was too difficult for them to actually achieve. And by 1877, Northerners are tired of fighting this war of trying to rebuild the South. And so all the violence that was taking place and things like that. So they uh, pulled out of the South, ended um, federal occupancy of the South, and um, 
uh, yeah, essentially allowed African Americans to um, be in um, this landscape where they weren't going to be treated uh, equally or uh, fairly, where the, they'd still be sharecroppers and wouldn't have many opportunities uh, for um, uh, equality and would actually be terrorized and be attacked as well. Okay. So thank you for listening to my lecture about Reconstruction. Be sure to uh, read the textbook as well. Um, it has a lot of great information that I didn't cover. But, um, yeah, be sure to uh, yeah, just follow up on uh, what we've been talking about. If you have any questions, please send me an email. Um, I look forward to uh, talking with you more uh, later. So, yep, uh, have a good one. All right, bye.